Friends, good morning, and welcome to interview number 14 with narcissistic psychopath H.G. Tudor. Now, I first came across this man's information in 2017, as discussed previously on the channel, and I had a massive light bulb moment. In 2020, I started my YouTube channel and immediately reached out to H.G. He was the first one I wanted to interview. And remarkably enough, not only did he grant an interview right away, um, We've done 14 since then. Every couple of months, we get together and discuss what I consider to be one of the most, if not the most important subjects on the planet, particularly during the times that we live in, of psychopathy. So without further ado, let's bring in the man of the hour himself. Sir, how are you doing? I'm very Both well. Job. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for inviting me back on. Always a pleasure to chew the cud with you. Already, already, HG, you're beginning. Okay. If you guys, if people don't know who you are, HG, mm -hmm. and they can't appreciate your sardonic sense of humor and why they should perhaps trust the quote unquote ultra, we usually jump into the meat of the interview right away. But since we have new listeners coming in, could you please give a brief summary of who is HG Tutor? What do you do? How did you come to do it? And how and what does the ultra actually mean? Okay. Well, my name is H.G. Tudor, which is a pseudonym. I don't use my real identity because I need to protect that to ensure what I do professionally I can continue to do without hindrance, interruption, or restraint. I'm a diagnosed narcissistic psychopath, and many years ago I decided it was about time that people would be encouraged by actually understanding the worldview of an individual such as myself and also to explain the way that my kind behave, both in terms of narcissistic psychopaths, pure psychopaths, but primarily narcissists, because there are more narcissists than anything else with regard to those three categories that I've just mentioned. And I saw on the internet that there was a host of information that was both missing and incorrect. And that offended my notion of control, because to have that inaccurate information being regurgitated and disseminated offended my need for accurate knowledge to be provided. Now, some people might think, well, why would you want people to have an accurate view about what your kind are? Well, the fact is that for anybody, you want people to understand what you are and it is, from an intellectual perspective, offensive that people go around saying the wrong things about my kind. You might think, well, one wouldn't care. But because of that need for control, one is moved to want to correct people. I find the absence of evidence and a failure to appreciate logic offensive and i regularly teach and preach i guess to those that work with me and my followers and listeners about utilizing evidence rather than going on emotional responses and speculative journeys that it's about being a person where in this age as you've touched upon doug it's so important to utilize the touchstone of evidence in a world of strident feelings at the moment. And thus, I embarked on the creation of a vast repository of information through my blog writings and through my videos, explaining how I see the world, how others of my kind see the world. And I then also allow people to access me so that I can help them determine, are they dealing with a narcissist? What are they? Are they themselves, the individual, an empath or something else? And to speak to me so that I can unravel for them the various puzzles that they found themselves caught in with the narcissist and offer practical assistance. And amongst all of this, I explain to people the various facets of the dynamic between the psychopath and the victim, the narcissist and the victim, all the various manipulations that take place, how I understand empathic individuals so well and why that is, snippets of my life story, and also analysis of famous and infamous people who may or may not belong to my brethren so that people can understand 
what those individuals are and what makes them tick. Very well said. And as usual, my friends, I will leave a link in the description box to the plethora of knowledge, not just videos, but consultations, books, and everything that this man has available in the description box. And you can find it in the description box of HG Tutor if you're on his channel. Speaking of this strident need to lead by feelings in the world of cancel culture, mm -hmm. and since I know you and I both love the subject of celebrity so much, HG, okay. let's start off with the vapid, trite, and irrelevant subject of celebrity beginning with the Russell Brand. The reason I bring this guy up, my man, is because he's come up quite a bit recently on the channel. Is he a narcissist? Was he a victim of cancel culture because he speaks out against the narrative? You did a 16-part series which I actually listened to, a couple mm -hmm. of the videos I listened to multiple times. As usual, my man, you do one hell of an evidence-based breakdown. If yes. you don't mind, and I will link the series in the description box, because spoilers, my friends, he's been kind enough to summarize this thing. I asked him beforehand. Mm -hmm. But HG, can you um, decipher, well, what you did to go about um, concluding what you concluded? Mm -hmm. What is the conclusion? Is he a narcissist or not? What's school in mm -hmm. Cathra? And then also... Does the him speaking out against the narrative supposedly, in your view, play into that in any way or not? Okay. Well, for those of you who want to get the detailed breakdown, I'd invite you to press pause on this video now and go over and watch that 16 part series so you can enjoy and be fascinated by the forensic analysis of what Russell Brand is. If you'd rather save that to a later time, that's fine. But here comes the information. I have many parts to these series because I regularly explain to people that it is extremely dangerous and erroneous to say, oh, that person fails to return my telephone calls. They keep ghosting me. They must be a narcissist. You cannot make a determination from one act or one behavior alone. What you must do is look at a range of evidence from different sources of various behaviors over a sustained period of time. And to do the analysis of proper justice, that requires a multi-part series. Hence, I know that there are some individuals with blamange-like brains who just want the information given within the first 20 seconds. But I'm making people work. And, and what I also do is demonstrate in the course of the analysis that it might actually mean, could this mean that the person's actually empathic and there's been a reduction in their emotional empathy? Or is this actually a manipulation that you're dealing with to make people think? Because too often, people have become intellectually flabby and it's about time that people started to appraise it and consider and engage in some critical thinking rather than being spoon-fed. And consequently, taking people through the evidence so that they can also form their own views, practice what they've learned at the University of Tudor, so to speak, and debate with people in the comments section and also in the live chats as to what they think the individual is. And then having gone through the comprehensive look at that individual's life, we then have the determination. And with Mr. Brand, I determined that he is a narcissist. And I determined that by actually excluding the allegations that he's been on the receiving end of in relation to sexual misconduct against women in terms of sexual crimes of sexual assault and rape, I excluded that because one, they are simply allegations. And whilst the evidence on the face of it certainly looks credible, and there's evidently been a painstaking investigation undertaken by Channel 4's dispatches program and the Times, I felt that it was appropriate to exclude it because there's actually no conviction. And it would also head off at the past people bleating, oh, but they're just allegations, so you can't take them into account. So I also recognize there's more than enough material besides that to make a proper assessment upon. So I excluded those allegations. I talked about them because they're there and they're pertinent in that respect. But when I did my final conclusion, I excluded that information. Interesting. And I concluded that he's a narcissist. 
because he exhibits a heightened sense of entitlement in the way that he treats people, that he exhibits an absence of emotional empathy, which was occasioned by the way that, for instance, even when he was in school, he would regularly pick on one girl, the way that he treated his family dog, Topsy, that when it would climb to the top of the stairs, he would kick it down the stairs. Um, so that mistreatment of an animal showed an absence of emotional empathy. That he showed a lack of accountability for his behaviours because whilst he had issues with drink and drugs, when he had stopped indulging in those or at least telling the world that he stopped indulging in them, he still continued with certain behaviours which showed that actually his behaviour was not governed by addiction, it was governed by narcissism, that he didn't take accountability for the fact that he would stand up and drop his take off all his clothes in a public place by way of protest, that he would make unpleasant remarks about Bob Geldof at an awards ceremony, and he would repeatedly be contentious and in people's faces. And of course, he built a career on all of that. And you might think, well, that's just a persona that he adopts for the purpose of television. It isn't. That's how he behaved all of the time. There's also evidence of grandiosity. He absolutely loves being spoken about. Indeed. Yeah. He wants to be the center of attention, so he engages in showmanship. He thinks he's cleverer than he actually is. He thinks he's superior to what he actually is. There is uh, embellishment. He uses flowery language. He's clearly an articulate man and of intelligence. You can't take that away from him. But it's everything is a performance. I could imagine that if it was being witnessed, Russell in the bathroom first thing in the morning turns into a five-part series where he talks about everything that he's doing in some kind of Dickensian way if his girlfriend or wife is watching what he's doing. because. It has to be witnessed. He is the great Russell Brand. He exhibits magical thinking because he presents himself as this almost kind of messiah-like individual that, yes. I know the truth. You are the awakening wonders. I have come to you with the real information. Now, while some of that may be accurate, the way that he presents himself as this messiah demonstrates this magical thinking and also the fact that he holds himself out as having conquered his demons and keeping right. them in check when it's quite clear and apparent that he has not done so. Furthermore, uh, he can be haughty with individuals. He's arrogant. He's dismissive. It's interesting when you watch the footage that I put up in one of the, in relation to one of the videos, videos, I beg your pardon, where he boxed his father and the way that he talks and the way that he interacts well, with his father. It's evident that his father is a narcissist and the genetic predisposition was passed on from his father. And uh, young Russell grew up in an environment which was a lack of control. His father was in and out of his life, was missing on repeated occasions. Indeed, his father says to him in the video footage, you were very emotional about the fact that I wasn't there. I didn't really understand it. So his father had no comprehension about how his absence affected his son, showing the absence of emotional empathy on the part of Mr. Brand Sr. And he engages in various manipulations. He triangulates people. He uses charm. He uses flattery. He uses circular conversations. He is a poor listener. If you ever watch him debating yeah. somebody, he doesn't actually listen to what the other person is saying. It That's is right. a tsunami of word salad. That's right. Al albeit... It seems impressive at first, right. but he just deluges so that people are it's almost like they are they are battered into submission under the weight of all of the thorough exactly. words that he pours forward. <laughs> So much of what you're saying, HG, sorry to interrupt, it sounds like a new age cult cult guru, man. He's one step away from Jared Leto, or he reminds me of Leto. These yeah. B level or D level celebrities that turn into cult gurus, just everything you're saying. Sorry, please continue on. Quite all right. So all, all of this supported the fact that he was a narcissist, that there was a, so many instances of a sense of entitlement, an absence of emotional empathy, a lack of accountability for his behaviours, grandiosity, magical thinking, that he would be haughty on occasions, that he had a range of manipulative behaviours that he would engage in. Man has no boundary recognition. And yeah. finally, he shows various aspects of the narcissistic dynamic, which enabled me to reach that conclusion. And in terms of his school in Kadra, again, if you've not watched the series, pause it and go, and you might want to go and listen to that video. But the outcome was that he was what I categorize as upper lesser type A elite. So his Kadra is elite because he shows a lot of cerebral characteristics. He's clearly well read. 
He has written many books. He has an interest in arts and film and music, current affairs and politics. So he ticks a lot of cerebral boxes. But he also touches a lot of somatic boxes. He has expensive tastes. He likes money. Uh, if you were to be objective, I know he's not everybody's cup of tea, but you would say that he was good looking. He's body conscious. He's maintained the same body weight for years. He doesn't necessarily look particularly clean and well-groomed, but he has a cultivated look that associates with the somaticism, almost, as you've pointed out, this sort of uh, cult leader uh, in, in sort of the flowing robes kind of thing. Yeah. Um, he is hypersexualized. I mean, the man won shagger of the year, three years running. So he has a lot of somatic traits. So we have an amalgam of both somatic and cerebral combined, right. which creates an elite, but he's somatic leaning. Now, in relation to his school as an upper lesser type A, what that means is that he's actually a rather superficial individual that doesn't operate with a facade, and he puts it all out there. And the way that he's put it all out there, he's actually done it in two different ways. Initially, it was basically, I like shagging, I drink, I take drugs. I'm basically this dervish, a bundle of energy that will do anything for for the basically attention. And here I am, it's me, Russell Brand, listen to me now, all hail the brilliant but kind of flawed genius that I am. He was in your face. He didn't pretend to be a good person. He didn't maintain this clean living lifestyle that he would hide behind. He was very much, what you see is what you get. And he's the type of individual that you wouldn't go to and go, oh, Russell, my wife's left me, because he'd probably go, great, we can go and go to the strippers now without you worrying about your wife knowing about it. Whereas you want a shoulder to cry on, he's not going to provide that to you. And then his narcissism recognized that the whole vaudevillian Dickensian uh, hedonist wasn't quite hitting the mark any longer. And it decided instead to shift the modus operandi to reformed guru thought leader who has all the answers but again he puts it all out there he's in your face he talks to you from home he says yeah you know, i'm a narcissist although he doesn't truly recognize what that means and what he is an excellent example of is a narcissist who's been in therapy where the therapy has done nothing other than weaponize him further so he can use what he's learned in therapy to spout it towards his audience to control them wow. by making them think Russell Brand is a redeemed individual, he is a reformed character, he stayed clean. No, his narcissism just decided we don't need to do the drink and drugs as much or as at all. Here's a different way that we can be in everybody's face for the purposes of gaining that control and fuel from people. And hence, as per my categorization, the outcome would be upper lesser type A with the cadre of elite. Fantastic summary, ma'am. And guys, if you haven't listened to it and you want to understand the terminology, we've covered it in previous videos and I want to keep it moving, but the cadre in school and his lexicon is easy to understand. It's an incredible category categorization. So if you want to understand that, you have to watch the incredible series i absolutely love these series that you do my man he's broken down johnny depp and amber heard of course he covers uh harry's wife and a plethora of other celebrities so jumping off from the celebrity aspect maybe to take a shower so to speak hg and clean up a little bit maybe we can move it over to the area of artist slash art and we okay. kind of touched upon this in one of the previous interviews how much of if you had to take a guess um of the art that we're exposed to in modern times and maybe even the past, how much is it actually created by narcissists, your kind, and how much of an effect would that have on the population's um, eating up said entertainment? Well, with the art and arts generally, I would suggest that you'd be probably looking at something in the region of about 75% of it is generated by uh, narcissists mm -hmm. in terms of uh, those that reach some form of fame or notoriety. 75%? Three out of four, my man? In, indeed, because it is a honeypot, like politics is and entertainment mm -hmm. is for narcissists. Yeah. Th th there are lots of people who engage in sort of hobbyist painting, or, you know, writing a novel or writing a play and so forth uh, that aren't narcissists, but it doesn't actually go anywhere right. because for them... It provides them with a sense of personal fulfillment. 
They're not really bothered about the recognition. It would be nice if it happened. But I enjoyed writing this book, and it was an interesting process. But I haven't got the time to dedicate to marketing to it. You know, I've showed it to a few friends and family. They have kindly bought it out of sympathy and fed back that they enjoyed it. But it doesn't become the be-all and end-all to that individual. But whereas with a narcissist, whatever they write, whatever they paint, whatever they create, not only do they see it as the pinnacle of what can be provided within that particular field, because their narcissism tells them as such, but they have that need for it to be recognized. So the narcissist pushes to gain representation, to gain publication, to gain the exhibition, so that with the art, etc., that people are familiar with that they see, a much greater proportion of it is going to be provided by narcissists because of the need for recognition that comes, and they push themselves into that position. Whereas so many other people, uh, if you were to say what's the proportion of all art or uh, music or writing that is created, both famous and non-famous, that's created by narcissists, you'd be looking at 10 to 15% because it would be commensurate with the number right. of uh, narcissists in the populace as a whole. But narcissists are very good at getting themselves recognized. Yes. They elbow everybody else out of the way. And attention, the feedback, the, the plaudits, the applause, is the fuel which is the lifeblood for the narcissist. So whereas Joe Ordinary, think, I'm not really that bothered that it hasn't been picked up and has made an exhibition, maybe next year, the narcissist is desperate to have it there. And you see with regard to the narcissist, they see themselves, or certain at least, as very complicated complex individuals right. and that they feel that they channel the essence of humanity through right. their art and this is why you, they end up explaining in very flowery language that where they basically look as though that they've vomited onto a piece of canvas that how that represents the torturous existence of man through his enslavement with the female form and you're thinking, right, I'll well, see where I can see that. But they, through their magical thinking and through their need for recognition, will talk in such grandiose terms. And so many people, of course, often take the piss out of particularly modern art by saying, well, you know, I could have done that. But invariably the comeback to that is, but you didn't, did you? And the reason is, is that that individual doesn't actually have it in them. And many narcissists have it in them because they want the world to see it. And thus, they're the ones that create it. And also, then, are able to say that represents this because of their need to portray themselves as this particular talent. Now, in some instances, you will get a narcissist that has a labor of love that's taken them 15 years to create because they, they are such a perfectionist in terms of what they want to generate. But a lot of what is created comes from narcissists because narcissists want the world to look upon their brilliance. And some are brilliant, we know that. Others, less so, but the world still must see it. And I know we've covered this a couple times before, HG, but before we go on to the next part of that, could you just give a quick list of what you would consider... Um, elite narcissists. I know there's too many narcissists to list in uh, famous narcissists in general, but what about a few elite narcissists that spring to mind that are famous artists we might recognize to drive home the example you just gave? Well, it's got to be remembered that when you're talking about the elite cadre, so it's not elite in the sense of superior, it's mm -hmm. elite in the sense of having um, an amalgam of both um, somatic and cerebral so it's the common i mess that i mess that apg i'm sorry because it's probably going to drag out the question too long what i'm exactly what i meant to say is self-aware narcissist greater narcissist oh i see okay sorry about that well, in terms of self-aware narcissist which is the greater category we split that up into three sections lower mid uh, mid middle and upper and a sort of a brief background in relation mm -hmm. to that. 
so that people understand. Please. Um, lower greater, you tend to find them in politics and military. They're often the iron fist and the velvet glove. M middle greater, rampant in the ent entertainment, sort of tech industries, philanthropy. Upper greater tend to be not necessarily as famous because they're eminence greases. They're the master puppeteers that work behind the scenes. They'll be very well known within certain circles, but might not be internationally famous. So in terms of some uh, narcissists that are aware, you, know, you could do some sort of, uh, historically, now, Napoleon was a lower greater. So there he fits within the military. Uh, Elizabeth I, she was an upper greater. Henry VIII, lower greater, because he was far more brutish in the behaviours that he engaged in. Alexander the Great, he was a lower greater as well. Um, so you have uh, individuals there from history that were aware of what they were. But naturally, they wouldn't say to themselves, I'm a greater narcissist. They would have a different understanding of what that actually amounts to. HG, what would go on? Uh, this is why I love picking your brain because we don't pontificate or speculate about there's a million channels on narcissism, but we get to talk and actually hear it from you, a real narcissist in their brain. What the hell would one of these graders like Napoleon actually be thinking in their head regards their narcissism? Would they consider well, it a great gift? How are they aware of it? You know what I mean? Well, how they're aware of it is just simply the fact that they are because that's the way that they have been created. Mm -hmm. But the way that it would manifest is as a consequence of they would recognize that they have a need for the responses of individuals to feel essentially good about themselves. So I call that fuel. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't necessarily refer to it in the same way. They know that they would get off on creating reactions. They knew that they had to be validated by people responding to them. You, you must acknowledge me. You must ensure that I am known. So they would know that they needed that, that it was important to them. They would recognize that if they didn't get that, that it would make them feel small and weak and powerful. And they recognized that they um, had the means to fight against that. They would recognize that they found it fascinating and entertaining to manipulate people. They know, or rather the new, the historical ones, they knew that they were manipulative. They knew that they would plot a way to get what they wow. wanted. They saw people as pawns which were there as part of the game. So they wouldn't necessarily say to themselves, I'm an aware narcissist. What they would be aware of is they would be aware of the things that they would need. They would be aware of the fact that they required control over people, that they couldn't stand for people not to be under control, that they knew that they were destined for greatness because they were superior. They knew that they stood apart from other people. They would know that what they said had weight and uh, impact and import upon people because they were higher born, for example, that they had an expectation that people would fall in under them because they were great and they, they were talented and they, they knew that they had to have all of this in order to achieve, that they knew that they needed to control, that they knew that they needed reactions. They were aware of the presence of that emptiness that they would wow. fight against. So they would have an awareness all of all of those things. What they wouldn't do, of course, is go around talking about right. it because they would also recognize in so doing. So they might have various other descriptions for it. And I'm sure that if one spent some time perhaps looking back, as I've mentioned, at those historical individuals, if you perhaps looked at some of their writings or their diaries or, you know, where... Uh, for instance, Henry VIII would write papers upon particular religious subjects, you would probably find in amongst there demonstrations of the awareness of what they're doing. I mean, a good example of a modern uh, aware narcissist is Taylor Swift. She knows what she is, and what she does is she is essentially laughing at people calling her a narcissist, as if to say, yeah, I know I am, but I'm not going to give you the satisfaction of admitting it. And even in one of her recent songs, she talks about, it must be my covert narcissism. And she's basically 
flipping the bird at people to say, I know what I am, and you think you've worked me out. Well, it doesn't matter because here I am, a uh, absolutely adored musical artist who's worth hundreds of millions of dollars on a um, absolutely world-busting tour at the moment with people getting to the point of nearly killing one another to lay their hands on tickets. And she knows, and she knows that she plays with men. You only have to look at a track record, and she finds it entertaining to do so. And if she were, for instance, not that she would, but if she was to happen upon what I'm saying now, she would laugh about it because she would think, yeah, he knows, but I'm not going to give him the satisfaction of admitting it. So she's a middle grater, of course, within the entertainment industry, portrays herself as ostensibly a kind individual, but doesn't give a flying fig, knows full well what she is. And because of her awareness, she regularly utilizes her songs to show you that she's an aware narcissist. And so many people miss it. I've mentioned it before. Watch the video to blank space. She's saying to you, this is what I am. But I'm wrapping it up in a song so that her supporters and followers think, oh, no, she's just talking. You know, it's a, it's a story. No, she's not. She's telling you what she is. But too many of you are blind to it. Wow. Once I learned about narcissism, particularly from UHG, when I would, when I would listen to songs and you know, music, art, movies, so much of what you said is created by narcissists and spending some time in Hollywood, it makes a hell of a lot more sense. It's able to connect a lot more dots, simply understanding the subject where why will certain people, a lot of the people that I hung out with do literally anything and make, including making asses of themselves to try to make it when they don't just rely on their talent and take their time. Um, I don't think it's mm -hmm. any surprise that Hollywood is loaded with these people, but I didn't realize it was three out of four, but that makes a hell of a lot of sense. Now, since most are not aware narcissists, first of all, what percentage would be, you know, fit this unique category where they're actually aware? Cause I know it's really low. Right. And then also it, it's, in the op, it's like a null, null point something. Percent. Really? So it's not even yeah. 1%. That's how rare it is, my friends. And, and then yeah. also to counterpoint that, what would a non-narcissist, the majority, what would be going on inside of their head? They wouldn't understand why they act the way that they do. They wouldn't understand why their needs aren't met, et cetera. What's going on inside their minds? You mean the, un the unaware, unaware narcissist, narcissist as yeah. compared to what you just delineated? Well, the unaware narcissist is fed, if you will, thoughts and feelings by their narcissism to compel them to go after the prime aims. So as people know, the prime aims are control, fuel, character traits, and residual benefits. So an analogy would be with a non-narcissist their throat is dry and it feels uncomfortable, so they recognize that they're thirsty. That's the way the body says you're dehydrated. Because if it didn't do that, and you didn't regularly set your watch to drink some water, say, every three hours, you would die. So your body has created a method of compelling you to stay alive by going and getting you to stay hydrated. Ditto, your tummy rumbles, you feel faint, that's your body saying, go and eat, so you stay alive. With the narcissist, what the narcissism does is it wants the narcissist to get the prime aims. So it wants the narcissist to control people. But the narcissist doesn't think when they're an unaware narcissist, I must control these people around me. That person is threatening my control. It doesn't think, ah, I need some fuel from people. It doesn't think, I need to commandeer character traits. What the narcissism does is it wraps up the pursuit of those things in something else. Mm. So, for example, it tells the narcissist that his partner is flirting with a man at the, uh, flirting with, uh, a man at the bar so that he is then motivated by his narcissistic trait of jealousy and the ignition of his fury to go over and say, what the fuck do you think you're doing chatting up my girlfriend? Now, what's happened there, he's gone over to control that man and his girlfriend and draw fuel from them by way of response. But how did the narcissism get him to do it? It told him she's flirting. She wasn't. It re the narcissism rewrote history to tell him that that man was being flirtatious with his girlfriend and she was being flirtatious back. That belief 
and that feeling of fury at how dare he, that, that dog, try and get in on my lady, compels him to go over and get two of the prime aims. So he doesn't think to himself, ah, he represents a threat to my control. I'm going to go over there and nullify that threat. He thinks, I'll show that motherfucker. Yeah. I'll show him. Who, who does he think he is? And so for an unaware narcissist, there are so many different ways that the narcissism compels them to pursue the prime aims, but describes it as something else. It's a little bit like you've got a child who needs to take some medicine. And if you attempted to spoon the medicine into the child's mouth, they know it tastes foul, so that mm, mm, and they're turning their head away from it. So what do you do? You have to con the child into taking the medicine by either saying, I'll let you play on the Xbox if you take it. So the aim is to get the medicine inside of them, but the Xbox is the method of getting it to be taken, or perhaps popping it in their drink so they don't realize that they're actually drinking it. And so it's similar. The unaware narcissist doesn't know that they're pursuing the prime aims. The narcissism, in effect, hoodwinks them by making it about something else so that they then pursue the prime aims unwittingly. That makes total sense. And this explains why you can't tell, a, especially an unaware narcissist, that they are a narcissist. What? Yeah. So there's no, this is a good point to drive home to HG. There's no fixing them, which is what I finally learned. After many attempts, once they are a narcissist, that's it, man. There's no growing a conscience and a wide spectrum of emotions once that's gone. Another question that's also come up that people ask is, do narcissists, psychopaths, sociopaths, do they actually have any emotions? Do you have any emotions? I do. Um, it is a common misconception that we're emotion-free. Right. We do have them. Narcissists are more emotional than those with antisocial personality disorder, uh, commonly referred to as psychopaths and sociopaths. With a narcissist, they will have emotions of fury, hatred, antipathy, jealousy, envy, infatuation, so and others besides. And they're able to emulate certain right. emotions, sadness, joy, but although they don't truly experience right. it. It is, a, it is a fabrication that is portrayed to the outside world. And so similarly for myself, um, as a narcissistic psychopath, my emotional range is actually pretty muted. But I've learned, for example, that in the course of when I make my videos, when I talk to you, when I talk to people in consultation, is to ensure that I utilize tone and cadence and emphasis in order to sound more natural when I'm talking to people, that I've learned to be that way. And that in terms of emotions, I'm largely someone that um, is pretty stable in the sense of the emotional output that I provide. But in order to fit in, in order to move amongst people so they don't pick up on what I am, I, I have learned how to express joy. I've learned how to express irritation. I don't really deal with sadness. I don't sit and cry about things. I see it as beneath me, and I don't even feign that because it disgusts me. But I'm able to articulate concern for somebody and actually sound concerned and look concerned and appear to express the emotion of concern, but I'm actually not. I've simply learned to do it. So we do have emotions, but it's a more muted and limited emotional range that exists. Very interesting. And you don't feel, just a narcissist in general, they don't feel happiness? Have you ever felt one moment of happiness? Have you ever felt one moment of sadness for real? Narcissists don't experience happiness. So wild. They're, it, it, it is the sensation of power that comes from the receipt of fuel. Of course, their narcissism tells them they feel happy. Mm -hmm. So they articulate, oh, I'm really happy being with you and smile and look gleeful. So that person responds in a favorable way, thus denoting that they are under control and that they provide fuel by way of that response. The outward expression of happiness is achieved, again, for the prime aims. Right. Because whenever a narcissist is interacting with another person, it is always, always about the prime aims 
and nothing else. For those that might be new, HG and joining us, can you briefly expand upon that a little bit? Because it's hard for people to understand if you can't feel joy and happiness, the general motivation that normal people would feel to drive them through life and to go after certain rewards, jobs, et cetera, this thing that's driving yes. you is exactly what, and could you explain what it feels like and what it, what it is that's driving the narcissist? Well, as a narcissistic psychopath, I have in effect two drivers, the prime aims on the one hand, and then because of my psychopathy, the hyper-focus to achieve, play games, and alleviate boredom. Mm -hmm. But if I just focus on what drives the narcissist, because there are more narcissists than exist, it's, it's about the prime aims. Now, the majority of narcissists are unaware, so they don't know that this is what's governing them. But it is. So the prime aims is applicable when the narcissist is interacting with another human being or contemplating such an interaction. So the prime aims is governing my interaction with you. So as I'm talking to you, I do so, and I'm fully aware of why I'm doing this. I'm polite and courteous with you. Mm -hmm. I answer your questions and do so expansively. I don't sort of give you a short answer and then sit there and make it awkward. I'm doing so because that enables me to control you in this conversation. And I'm, of course, aware that people are going to listen to this, watch this video. And therefore, I recognize that the most appropriate way to control them so that they have a good account of me is to be informative, entertaining, and interesting. I'm receiving fuel from you because I hear what you say. I can see you, so I can see you nod, and I can see the expressions that you make as I talk, so I'm receiving fuel from you. I may acquire character traits from you. Really? Like in our previous discussions, absolutely, where you've talked about your experience with Scientology, mm -hmm. I might well use that, respecting confidentiality, but talk to one of my clients about saying, well, I have a client who was involved in a cult and these were this he had this experience and so forth so i acquire your character trait and use it elsewhere there's the res the residual benefit is you assist me in the maintenance of my facade interesting now I, oh, so, i'm sorry please that's quite all right so in this conversation the prime aims are governing what's going on between you and i i'm not polite and courteous because i'm polite and courteous I'm polite and courteous because it enables me to achieve something. Where if I crack a joke, it's not because I'm just being funny. I'm doing it because it enables me to control and draw a response. So everything about it is driven by that prime aims. So later on, I'm going out for dinner. The people that I'm engaging with over dinner, my interaction with them will be governed by the prime aims. It won't be governed by friendship wow. because they're not actually friends in the sense that they are for other people they are appliances to me they are there to be used vis-a-vis -vis the prime aims and often people fall into the trap of thinking surely some of it was right. genuine that the narcissist really did love me no the narcissist didn't their narcissism caused them to create a representation of love to control you to draw fuel from you you, by thinking you were being loved, become easier to control. And of course, what the narcissist is able to do is fall in with the narcissistic representation of love, which circles back to what we were talking about earlier, that all of these things with the heartfelt poetry and the uh, pop songs and the rock songs about how you know, I'll get there by a hot air balloon and I travel on a camel to <laughs> get across the earth to find you, you know, that everything I do, I do it for you, you know, uh, all, all of this, that the uh, richness of plays that have been written, the context of standing beneath the balcony in the pouring rain and reciting romantic poetry, that driven by the narcissistic representation of love, which then bleeds into the mainstream so that when somebody comes along and replicates that, they go, oh, he must really love me because he bought me a dozen red roses and stood in the rain underneath my balcony reciting uh, poetry and that he, uh, you know, walked five miles when there were no taxes to be able to come and see me and all of these things. And it's not because it's not founded on emotional empathy and because so many narcissists have 
caused the world to believe that love is these is this romantic grand gesture that people then accord that with love and it blindsides them brilliant man i mean i that's just so that explains so much about my upbringing so every movie done by disney and most of hollywood is made by your kind because true love would not um be somebody you know standing outside getting soaked and reciting poetry and all the shit that we see growing up it would be actually caring for the person being there during hard times it's not like you said this romanticized version that we have about what love looks like and how much is that replicated by normal people who aren't narcissists that's terrifying uh what exactly. you just said and that's the, that's the problem you see you could go and watch a movie that shows all of this and think to yourself exactly it's just a movie so it, it happens in films in real life it's not real life it's escapism it's a suspension of disbelief and there are people who are capable of doing that mm -hmm. and that's all well and good in, in the same way, you know that there isn't a man with an S on his chest and his underpants on the outside of his costume that flies around the earth and, and struggles with kryptonite. You recognize that's fiction. So there are, there are people who know that this is just a representation that's there to entertain. But the problem is that so many people think that's how it should be. That is an accurate representation of love, and it isn't. It's the narcissistic representation. And that's what becomes so advantageous to us, is that it has bled into the mainstream so that empathic people and normal people think that when somebody behaves that way, that must mean they really love them. And the fact that if somebody sweeps you off your feet, it's meant to be that they've been fallen from heaven and they've got stars in their eyes and all of this nonsense. They think, oh, it must mean something and that butterfly sensation and so forth. In actual fact, if you find that you're getting butterflies around that person, you might do well to run away from them because that's probably a signal that you're dealing with a narcissist. Instead, a successful relationship that's founded on emotional empathy grows organically. It takes its time. And even still, there'll be people who will say, well, I met my husband, you know, and our eyes locked across the room and it was love at first sight and everything's been, you know, hunky-dory since then. Well, you just got lucky if that was the case. Because ordinarily, those circumstances, it ends up being a relationship with the narcissist. Well said. And that's probably why the love bombing aspect, uh, where you're presented a fake facade of who this person is, and especially if they're a good actor, why it works. You know, you make the point that, of course, as we get older, HG, we recognize that. But as a kid, surely the subconscious is being programmed when our parents put us in front of every Disney movie, teaching yep. us what love is supposed to be. And that probably bleeds over to some degree, even as we get older. Well, it does. The, the concept of someday my prince will come. Yeah. That, that stems from your childhood. The idea of, you know, Prince Charming rescuing the damsel in distress, etc. But oh, you know, it's just a story, but it's representative. And it feeds into people's concepts and expectations of relationships. Indeed. What you also then have, of course, is that you have a plethora of unaware narcissists who tell you, this is how you pick up women. This is wow. how you should date men. And they, they out of their self-absorption and sense of entitlement, they write books about the sort of rules of engagement in romantic relationships. And people go, well, you know, I'm struggling a bit to find a relationship. I'll buy this book and follow what it says. And what they right. don't realize is they are being coached by an unaware narcissist as to how to deal with people. So, for example, they will say, you should expect a man to want to date you within X number of days. No. You should expect that the man would say, really enjoyed last night. I'd like to see you again. Are you available in the next couple of weeks? Right. Yes, I am. Great. I will get in touch with you in 10 days' time to fix something up. And then in 10 days' time, he messages you and said, are you still interested in going out? And you go, yes. And he goes, fantastic. Well, how about we go to this restaurant? Super. I'll pick you up at eight. Now, that individual has demonstrated boundary recognition. He's not been pestering you in between. He's shown that he's actually got other things going on in his life, so he's not monopolizing your time. He's demonstrated that he can fix to a commitment because he said, I'll contact you in 10 days' time, and he did. But other people would think, I've not heard from him. He, he, 
well, he, he, you've not heard from him because he said he'd get contact you in 10 days. Yeah, but you think if he was interested, you know, he'd be messaging me because isn't that what people are meant to do, that they're meant to be keen and show that keenness to you? No, but that's what happens, that people mistake this silence as he's not interested. Why? Because some clown in a dating supposedly expertise book has written, if the man doesn't get in touch with you within seven days, you can see that he's not interested in you. No, actually, it's probably because he's got a job and friends and hobbies and he's respecting your boundaries. If he's incessantly messaging you, he's trying to bring you under control and he's not recognizing boundaries and he's monopolizing your time. But again, people fail to pick up on this because there's so much material written by unaware narcissists that says he should be contacting you. Why? Well, that's because the narcissist, that's the way the narcissist behaves. So the unaware narcissist is bound to write about that as saying, this is how it should be, because that's the unaware narcissist perspective on how you date somebody. And then non-narcissists read this and think, yeah, right, that's how it should be, isn't it? Rather than thinking, actually, that's unhealthy. Fantastic, fantastic pointers, ma'am. HG, we've been going for about an hour. It's been another jam-packed. I mean, I always get lost in these conversations because we're talking about something very personal and you have a particular way, not least being one yourself, of actually hammering these really important points home like um, like nobody else, in my opinion. Do you mind if I ask you one more question that jumps off of the art and then we'll roll out of here and I'll give you a chance for people to tell you where they can find you and such? So um, we touched upon this briefly before. But, uh, you know, I did your, your test and I came out to be an empathic person, yes. despite feeling like I was a secondary sociopath growing up HG because of the series that we did where we talked about growing up in Scientology, right? Then I get out and my empathy kind of starts, I know you're going to hate to hear this, but my heart opened up my friend and I actually cared about other things and people rather than just trying to survive the environment that I was in with the cult and my family. Yeah. So being kind of two different people, seeing things from opposite sides of the spectrum. I would say when it comes to being an artist or an artist, and especially after what you just described today about having to have character trait ac acquisition, you gave me an example of using me, yeah. the kind of robotic, for lack of a better phrase, my friend, about putting together maybe a piece of art or structuring it intellectually rather than from the heart, as an, as an empath would say. Yes. Wouldn't you be limited or wouldn't the artists in general the 75% that you talked about be limited and actually creating something original, something that had a real emotional power because you can't fake it, right? And then also because the narcissists have such a dominant factor on the subconscious via the arts, from my perspective, the world would be a very, very different place because of the power of art if it was run by my kind. What say thee to that? Well, who says that any art must always be created with emotion in it? Interesting. So take, for example, the humble carrot. Okay. We know carrots to be largely straight and orange with the green bit on the top. But historically, they never looked like that. They were twisted and rather ugly to look at and purple in color. And what did we do? We altered them. So from its raw, natural state, we created something in a more cynical fashion, which actually you would say is more attractive to look at, possibly even tastes better than the original. But it isn't the original. And thus, just because something has been created in an original way with emotion, doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be superior than something that has been created through appraisal and an intellectual approach. So you could have both things existing, which could be viewed as equally interesting and stimulating, even though one has been done from the heart, as you empaths would say, and whereas the other has been done from the mind, as my kind would engage in where we're aware of doing that. There is no monopoly on saying that it must that great art must always include emotion. Indeed, I would warrant that there will be certain pieces of art that exist, that paintings, poetry, etc., that has been written by a narcissist that people would say that's chock full 
of empathy and understanding. And the fact is that a very clever and evolved narcissist is brilliant at picking up on what other people say and do. I regularly, and you've said it yourself, my level of understanding of the empathic mind, people there, how on earth are you able to understand and convey this? Not being one yourself. I watch, I listen, I observe, I think. And so in the same way, one can observe and think about the way that a picture should be painted or that a novel should be structured. And what it is, is that people have this romantic notion that art and expression ought to come from a place of emotion rather than cold, cynical, calculated intellectualism. And they find it offensive to think that somebody could just sit almost like a robot and go and make a painting. I could imagine that there'll come a point, because at the moment you can still tell when something has been created by AI. You can see, because it has that waxy aspect to it. But not forever, HG. Not it's forever. coming where we ain't going to be able to tell the difference. Exactly. And you'll look at something and you'll say, which one of those has been painted by AI? Which one is it? And you won't be able to tell. I know. And the other one, you'll say, that was painted by a human being, you know, that pour their heart and soul into it. And we know that that individual was a normal or empathic. So that there was emotion channeled into it. Bear in mind as well, of course, that it's not exclusively an emotional act, the creation of art, that you will That's use your point. intellect in it as well, that you will structure it and think about the composition and the positioning and so forth. And where am I going to go with this particular plot? Where's this character art going? So for a non-narcissist, you have an amalgam of both emotion and intellect. Whereas on our side, it all comes from a position of intellect and mimicry and copying but what you also get of course is that many narcissists through character trait acquisition will take somebody else's idea and they'll improve upon it because they're able to look at it and often can do so perhaps with a clearer mind because they are not caught up in a fog of emotional responses to the same extent so it isn't the preserve great art and great uh, writing etc is not just the preserve of those that imbue emotion into what they do by way of emotional empathy. And uh, that's my view on what you've suggested there. That is a fascinating answer, ma'am. I mean, that's not ex what I expected. I thought I got you on that one, HG, but you make some very, very valid points and it's very interesting hearing from your side about that. Um, well, for ex uh, instance, uh, mm -hmm. I, I have a fantastic imagination. When now, I narcissists die. can have imagination, uh, HG, not to get confused with that has nothing to do with emotion or what we were talking about earlier or being unoriginal. You can still have a quote unquote imagination, right? Just wanted to yeah, clarify. One, one can imagine, again, the narcissists that have created fantastic worlds, mm -hmm. uh, which have become the staple of sci-fi series or fantasy series and so forth. They've done so. But what often will happen is they will take an existing scenario, maybe an, an historical one, and they've thought, how can I make that more interesting? How can I improve upon that? What can I do to really turbocharge it? Now, of course, a non-narcissist can do similar also. So, but with the narcissist, there will be a lot of taking from elsewhere. Not, not necessarily, of course, certain narcissists are out and out plagiarists. We right. see that happen. But I'm talking more about a concept and then thinking right how can i how can that be improved upon and remember particularly with your more evolved narcissists with the graters that we think ahead about what's going to happen so you translate that into the creation of a character arc and a plot the narcissist is able to anticipate if i do this knowing human nature the likely reaction of this person will be this or it could be this so if you're able to do that with regard to your own manipulations and machinations, you can then translate that skill into the creation of writing a book or a play, et cetera. Wow. That makes total sense. You know, it's almost like what you were talking about with the AI analogy, and this is terrifying and hopefully I'll be uh, dead before this happens, HG, <laughs> but there's going to come a time probably during our lifetime when AI is going to surpass what any human can, can do. And we're not only going to not be able to tell the difference between original art and AI generated art, 
the AI generated art is going to far surpass anything we humans can do. So mm -hmm. according to one of our other conversations that we had, why do we need any of us from your perspective? Right, my man? Well, <laughs> bring in the well, robots. Well, the problem with that is that we wouldn't get any fuel from a robot. Ah, interesting. Interesting. We, would, we, we need that yeah. emotional response that That's only right. human beings can provide. Right. Robots don't cry. You might be able to create it so that water leaks from their eyes, but ultimately you know it, it's similar to people have often asked about, should I emulate a particular emotion just to keep the narcissist on side? Mm -hmm. Of course, you should actually be applying no contact. And I said right. the problem also with doing that is the narcissist is actually relatively astute at picking up on when you're faking it. That's right. Because we're attuned to your natural emotions. So when you start to feign it, we see it, and then that becomes a threat to control, which then results in us lashing out at you. So similarly, we would be attuned to the way that raw human emotion is portrayed so that when a, if a robot was programmed to do it, we would, leaving aside the actual look of the thing, but the mannerism demonstrated wouldn't quite chime with what we were used to. And therefore, whilst you might get a narcissist caught out for a short period of time, they'd eventually realize, actually, this isn't genuine emotion that I'm experiencing, and therefore it's not going to be any good. So that's why we need to keep the empaths alive. Interesting. And this is kind of where we get the vampire analogy or metaphor, because what does it say also, HG, from your perspective that we can't have a world, thank God, of just AI and robots that your your kind need something from actual human beings, i.e. emotion, the emotional response. Is that sort of the X factor that humans have that your kind and or AI will never have? And that's why X amount of actual humans need to be kept alive simply for the narcissist to feed off of. Now, I would say that an empathic person gets their fuel, to use your analogy, from simply life itself, a good relationship, joy, yeah. struggling and working towards a goal. So we don't need to feed off the emotions necessarily. Um, yes. So, but your kind does, just in your opinion, what the hell does that say about, about that subject? Well, that's why with the, the narcissist presents as this paradox of on the one hand, being a freed individual, because we're not emotionally invested in anybody. We don't actually attach to anybody. We don't forge the links with anybody. We attach you to us. And that's why we're so able to walk away from people which appears so cold and so callous and leave so many people distraught. I was married to him for 15 years and he just walked out as if he never knew me. How can somebody do that? Well, a narcissist can because there's no actual genuine connection that exists. However, notwithstanding having that freedom, the narcissist is a slave to the necessity of control and fuel. And therefore, the narcissist can't just sit in themselves and enjoy the moment. The narcissism is always functioning like that background app to make the narcissist do something to maintain that control and can't just enjoy the moment and to generate the provision of fuel. So there's this interesting paradox with the narcissist on one hand, we're freer than anybody else because of the way that we're constructed. But on the other hand, we also have this aspect where we're chained to the necessity of control and fuel. And since you don't know the other side of truly having deep, I don't want to say deep emotions, the limit, a more limited spectrum of emotions where you can't in particular feel happiness, you don't have a conscience and you can't feel regret, which I would say, like you just said, is a power that's yeah. quite mind blowing to people that when they go to, when I go to sleep at night, if I do something bad, it'll weigh on my mind. But I don't think, um, in my family dynamic, my parents, had a second thought about everything that they put me through in the freaking cult. So yeah, no, I, did, I they didn't. Mm -hmm. They didn't. No, want I know, which is which is really hard to their, grapple with. Through their consciousness, and that again is the advantage that we have, yeah. which lends itself, of course, to very effective decision making mm -hmm. as well, because you're not hampered by emotional investment, sensations of guilt. That where I'm logic driven in the decisions that I make, the decision may upset people, but you can't fault its logic. Now, Absolutely. of course, there will That's be people right. who will disagree and say, well, because you're dealing with human beings, you can't just be like Mr. Spock. You have to 
factor in the fact that human beings have emotions. I understand that view. I don't accept it for me, and nor would I, because I function differently. But I see that the outcome of my decision making is superior because it's based upon pure logical outcomes. And the track record shows that I've been successful in everything that I've done because I adopt a logic based approach. I'm not hindered by emotional decision making. This has been an absolutely fascinating discussion, HG. Sorry to keep you over. If it's you don't right. mind, just I get lost in the in the conversations and I have a million other questions, but we'll end off for today. And if you don't mind, could you please tell people where they can avail themselves of the services that you listed at the beginning of the interview? Certainly. If you'd like to learn more about my fascinating and extensive work, you can find it in written form at narcsite.com. That's N-A-R-C-S-I-T-E dot com. Uh, there are thousands of blog articles with associated comments from a legion of very dedicated readers who have their own contributions to make. You can watch and listen to me at HG Tudor, Knowing the Narcissist, the Ultra, on YouTube. Those are the two main platforms. They also spread out onto Twitter and also onto Facebook. If you want my expertise to help you with the situation that you faced, go to narcsite.com or the description in any of my videos and you'll see all of the associated links where you can organize to find out whether your partner or boyfriend or wife is a narcissist. You can learn what type of empath you are if you happen to be one and you can engage my services in discussion through an audio consultation. You can also read my many books. I've written over 50 of them. You can find those in the Knowledge Vaults, which could also be found in the menu bar at narcsite.com or on Amazon. And I'd welcome anybody who requires that help or wants to understand more about narcissism and psychopathy to access my material. Man, you are a machine, HG, or should we say AI, or should we say Mr. Spock? But I personally appreciate it. I could never accomplish the amount that you've done using your logic and your psychopathy and I and many, many other people in this world really appreciate the work that you do. It doesn't matter that it's not driven by the heart. You've been extremely, extremely valuable, my friend. And until we speak the next time, take care of my man. You too. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, HG.